Well, good evening and welcome to our Bible study time, uh, April 1st, 2020, here from Tipton Baptist Church. Um, I hope that you're able to join us for a Bible study as we continue looking at some matters in Acts chapter 4. i uh, very excited to be able to come to you with this study in Acts chapter 4. And uh, we're going to open with a word of prayer and then we're going to get right into verse 13 of Acts 4. So I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the truths found in it. And daily as we're in it, we can give you thanks and praise for your goodness in revealing yourself through your word. Lord, as we uh, engage the word here this evening in, in Acts, God, help us to see uh, the events that took place that you've orchestrated way back in the early church. Help us to see uh, the love of you by your apostles and disciples. And help us to know, to respond with a kind of uh, Christ-loving pursuit that they responded with to people who uh, turned against them. Lord, may we see in Acts chapter 4 uh, a standard of living, a biblical uh, standard of living for the church. And may we at Tipton be that. We do bring before you people who are, are ill, uh, the Weddell family and, and in others, many others in the area. Please bless and uplift those with your healing hand, those who are not well. And Lord, please see us through as we know and can trust you will through these uh, crisis times. And uh, Lord, if anything, we ask to build our confidence and trust in you through your word in this time. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 13 is where we're going to be. And let's begin by reading it and then we'll go from there. Acts 4, 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Uh, Acts chapter 4, again, is a uh, picture of the early church, and it's beginning to navigate in the world with Christianity and evangelism at the helm. And Peter and John are noted in the first few chapters of Acts as being very outspoken about their faith in Jesus Christ, as they were the leaders of the church there, Jerusalem. Uh, right after, shortly after uh, the ascension of Jesus is when all this takes place. Where we're going today is we're going to reveal the point of Acts 4.13, and then we're going to let the Word of God lead us in asking some questions of the text as a Bible study. Number one, what is the most foundational Christian pursuit? Number two, what should Christians expect to be the response of the world to those who pursue this? And the third question is, can this be a test for the Christian to determine their value and their priorities in their own personal pursuits? And the fourth question would be, is there a resolute answer to that last question that gives confidence to the Christian in their pursuits? That's where we're going to go today. A foundational characteristic and major point of Acts, Acts 4.13 is this. It's a phrase, being with Jesus, in that verse. Look back in the verse with me. When they had seen the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled and they realized that those men had been with Jesus. They'd been with them. They were in His presence. There's something about the presence of being with Jesus that causes the one who had been with Jesus to be different. And it's noticeable. The point we're really wanting to consider is, is really Peter and John's example in their, their Christian pursuits as we see it laid out in early chapters of, of Acts, in particular chapter 4. Uh, I believe it's going to help lead us to grasp the foundational philosophy of an Acts 4 philosophy of Christian life. Being with Jesus is the found, at the foundation of it all. Um, we're going to see that this foundation remains the very rock-solid foundation that we today stand upon, to live as a Christ-exalting follower of Jesus. This point today, being with Jesus, it's actually expanded. Now, I'm going I'm to tell you the expanded point according to the remainder of the chapter, but being with Jesus, it brings one into a life which will begin to reveal Christ's likeness in pursuits and in values that we hold, and it also brings one into a life which begins to experience Christ-like circumstances. And this last part is a tricky, downright difficult one to swallow. But we see 
that that is what it means to be with Jesus. It, it means that we're brought into a life which will reveal Christ's likeness in our pursuits and in our values, but it also means that it brings us into a life that we begin to experience Christ-like circumstances. And we'll see what that means here in a few minutes. Peter and John reveal this through the early chapters, as I've mentioned, uh, beginning with Jesus as, as foundational. I have a picture of a brick wall. Jesus is rock solid. We know this. He's all-encompassing, all-exclusive, and the all-encouraging Savior of the world. We mentioned that last week in our intro to Acts chapter 4 Bible study. He is rock solid. He can be trusted in. You can count on Him. He's never failed. He's one that has made promises and kept them in ways better than we could have imagined Him keeping promises. We see that Peter and John believe that, and we quickly see in verse 13 that they're believing that Jesus is rock solid and foundational. It made quite an impact on the lives of those who were around them. Um, the pursuit of Jesus as the all-encompassing and all-exclusive and all-encouraging Savior had led Peter to not be able to help himself, but to keep speaking about Jesus. And we see that down a few verses in verse 20. He can't help himself but declare the truth that Jesus is this God-man. He really is. Uh, this foundational characteristic of being with Jesus led Peter to live and act and, 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 and carry on his days in his attitude this way. Um, it's as if Peter and John had tasted something that they could not live without, even if it meant at the expense of their own lives. They had tasted and been with a person. They had experienced a real intimate relationship with the God of the universe in human skin named Jesus Christ. And it was foundational. Being with Jesus was the foundation of all of Peter and John's activities. And the early church would thrive on this intimate relationship with Jesus being just that. Intimate and close and foundational. The question we can ask then, what is the most foundational Christian pursuit? And the answer is found in the phrase, as I mentioned earlier, being with Jesus. Being with Jesus is a life-changing event, and it changes us. So much so that it astonishes the world around us. Uh, consider verse 13 when we look at it, and we see that when the Jewish leaders had seen the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they weren't educated or trained in, in the Mosaic Law, they, they'd been fishermen, they weren't rabbis, they weren't teachers. Uh, when the Jewish leadership and those around Peter and John saw and heard them, they marveled. Peter and John were changed because of this foundational rock solid relationship with Jesus Christ. It changed them. There was an amazement because of Peter and John. And the amazement was of this person, Jesus, that they had been with. Well, what's the response then of a world relating to the Christian pursuit? What, how does the world respond to a Christian who has a rock solid, foundational, loving relationship, intimate with Jesus Christ, where they believe him and they trust him? What should we expect? Well, I think we should expect the world to see and be marveling at this one who we believe in. They should be astonished. And I think we've seen Christians over our lives who astonish us as Christians. We say, wow. We think of missionaries. We think of some of the, the greats of the church three, four hundred years ago as uh, the Reformation was, was shifting and bringing the church and riding the ship that had been sinking with indulgences in the Catholic Church and as Protestant Reformation took place. We see greats and we marvel at them and even up to the day and age we live in now, there are undoubtedly people we see and marvel at because of their faith and their relationship with Jesus being so rock solid. This is the response we should expect. We see it in verse 13 and we have seen it in people's responses to Jesus' own ministry. People marveled at him, at what he said, and of course at what he had done. Jesus and his followers cause the world to be astonished in a way which draws the world toward the view of God's magnificence and not our own. The response of the world should be astonishment at Jesus because we have faith and we are pointing everyone at him. I have an illustration about golf. Those of you who like golf, uh, I have a very close family member who loves golf. Over the years, he's golfed quite a bit, enjoyed many years, and uh, he got to actually be quite good at it. He had the great privilege about 25 years ago to attend the Jack Nicklaus and Jim Flick Golf Academy in California. There he learned many tips and was introduced to new skills and skill sets, and he honed in new patterns in his game. Uh, his score improved as a result. Uh, he enjoyed playing the game a whole lot more as well. 
Uh, it would have been crazy if this person that I'm very closely related to who had that experience, it would have been crazy if they would have said after going to visit the Golden Bear and learning from the most astonishing golfer probably ever, maybe one of the most world-renowned ones, Jack Nicholas. it would have been crazy to think that he would say, I'm going to forget everything I heard at that school and do my thing. It would have been crazy. It, being there in the presence of Jack Nicholas and learning from him changed this particular golfer, relative friend of mine, changed his, his entire life of golf. Nothing would be the same ever again because he had attended this school. He had spent time with Jack Nicholas. It increased his enjoyment. It made him understand the game better. He became, he became a better player because of it. And those around him noticed and were astonished at his score getting better and better over the weeks and months and years later. The influence Christians have on the world around them should be no different. We've been with Jesus. People should be astonished at Jesus. There's something about that Christian that their patience is greater. Their love and long-suffering is longer and fuller. Their graciousness is overwhelming. This is what it looks like to be with Jesus. And this is what the world should be astonished by, are pointing them to the one who is magnificent. Why should we expect anything less than the world being astonished when it sees Christ in us? He's amazing. He's wonderful. He's most satisfying and fulfilling. He is God in the flesh. Well, the, other, the next question would come then, about our pursuits, a test of our pursuits then. Can this instance in Acts 4.13 be a test of our pursuits? Well, ask yourself this question. If you were to write what you think people would be most astonished about in your life, would Jesus be a part of that answer? Only you know the true answer, as it lies deep in your heart, it's specifically in what you treasure. We know that Jesus has already taught us that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your pursuits reveal what you value the most. So yes, this instance in Acts 4 may very well be a good litmus test of our own pursuits and our own values. And it may help us zero in on the very thing that God wants us to focus on this very day, specifically pursuing time to be with Him in His Word. Pursuing being with Jesus today will begin the translation and transition of us to be more Christ-like and to be more vividly and astonishingly pointing people to Christ. So that brings us to a resolute answer with some implications to look at from this Bible study in Acts 4.13. A resolute answer uh, we find here. The implications of being with Jesus uh, and come from pursuing a deeper, more intimate relationship with Him in His Word. Uh, this answer, I believe, is a concrete answer. What happens when we spend time with Jesus? What is the result? What answer can we say could be across the board, something that we see biblically founded, something that we can see would be in any Christian's life who spends time with Jesus? The first thing is that I think it, it causes the Christian to pursue or to chase areas in which God is at work. When we, as Christians, see and identify through the Holy Spirit living in us, God working in an area, we sprint there and join that, encourage that, uplift that, support that, fund it, pray for it, be a part of it personally if possible. A massive implication is that Christians pursue in areas where God's working. In Tipton Baptist Church, it's no different. Where's God at work in the ministry here? Jump in. How is God working in the circles of influence that you are currently engaged in, in a normal world and in a regular routine, and in a world that's in crisis and in routines that are completely out of whack, totally off the wall, days that are not anywhere near normal for some and for many? Where's God working? Go join him there. This is a vivid picture of a Christian because it will reveal one who's been with Jesus when you join God in what He's doing already. The second implication, it's a, it's a resolute answer, is it causes the Christian to value and care for and love the things that God values and the things that He cares about and the things that He loves. When we've been with Jesus long enough, we begin to want to pursue and to love and to cherish and to talk about 
and to spend time doing the things that he loves and cherishes and talked about and did. Much like the friend and relative of mine with Jack Nicholas would begin carrying characteristics of his golf game into his golf game, he also carried characteristics and mannerisms while he just walked on the golf course. He'd been with Jack Nicholas. It just sort of happened. He spent time with a person. You begin carrying some characteristics of that person much of the time. It's no different here, but in a much deeper and more powerful way. It causes the Christian to value the things that God values and to value them in highest priority. And then we find when we do that that our joy and fulfillment and satisfaction as Christians increases because we're pursuing the things that God loves, which brings us joy because it brings us closer to Him. The third thing is that it causes the Christian to bring astonishment and a marveling of Jesus to the world around them, which may bring the last implication. But first, let me touch on this. When Christians live as those who've been with Jesus, it does cause the world to be astonished. It causes people to see and, and, and marvel at this thing in you, which we know is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it causes people to wonder and to be amazed at. I'm so glad that Jesus desires to use us, and we are so privileged to be used by Him, to reveal Him. And all my greatest efforts, by myself, I can't reveal anything but a broken, sinful man. But boy, as Christ living in me, I can reveal one who is far greater than I could ever aspire to be. And it gives me the contentment and the confidence that the one living in me is worthy of being marveled at. When I know I'm not, I know He is. Living as one who's been with Jesus is a guarantee that God's going to say, you've been with me, now I'm going to carry you into a world and in uh, relationships with people so that I can show them me through you. This is what it looks like to have been with Jesus. We can count on it. The last implication is this. It should be expected to cause the Christian to experience Christ-like circumstances. If we truly consider Christ's life and ministry the overall circumstances that Jesus lived with. They were not situations of mountaintop, exhilaratingly fun and entertaining experiences. They were full of affliction and persecution, an intense pursuit of his Father's desires for him and those around him through his affliction and persecution. We can pretty much take it to the bank and count on this to be true, according to what the Bible reveals. That being with Jesus, we should expect, if we've been with Him, to begin experiencing Christ-like circumstances. For it's in those circumstances, probably most of the time, that Christ can be seen most vividly in times that are hard. The 23rd Psalm wasn't written by accident. And it's not by accident that it's read at almost every funeral I've ever been to. It reveals Jesus as the hero. And that's exactly what people need in crisis. And that's exactly what people are looking for and longing for in crisis. And that's exactly much of the time where God puts his people so that Jesus can be longed for and seen in and through him because they've been with him. As this is played out in Acts chapter 4, this verse 12 and 13, as we see the, the introduction of Jesus being all-encompassing, all-exclusive, and the all-encouraging Savior, and that those who have been with Him cause people to marvel at Jesus, and they're astonished by Jesus in and living through people. As we see this as, as, as an introduction and as a foundation, and characteristic foundation of a person that's been with Jesus, Acts chapter 4 begins uh, to open up and unfold a lifestyle and, and a response to the world, which we're going to look into beginning next week. Uh, the philosophy in Acts 4 can be broken down in four ways. Uh, this is a theological position based on what we see to be true of what the early church did in Acts 4, and it's very much applicable to us in our day today. An Acts 4 philosophy means the, these are Christians, a, a way of life and a way of thinking based upon who God is and studying and knowing Jesus intimately because we've been with Him. These are people who proclaim Jesus as the hero and as the God-man unreservedly, unashamedly, and unapologetically. Jesus is God. I believe in Him. I know He's alive. I count on Him that He hears me, that He's never failed me, and I will believe it today when everything is crumbling around me. I'll be willing to proclaim Him even if it's to the point 
where my life is removed from this planet because my life is in Jesus' hand. This is the beginning of the Acts 4 philosophy, and we see that at the beginning of chapter 4, which we'll get into next week. A second thing we see in the Acts 4 philosophy is the Acts 4 philosophy reveals the Christian as a person who is a prayerful person. We're going to see that in Acts chapter 4. There's a whole block of the text that we see them pray, the Christians together. And the kind of prayer and their approach to God in prayer and how they use the verbiage that they use in prayer, these things really matter as it lays a pattern for us to be a praying people, an Acts 4 people. The third thing is, an Acts 4 people, they're people who are prepared to give until it hurts, and we see that in Acts chapter 4. And many of you at Tipton uh, already are those kind of people. And I don't think it's time to stop. I think it's time to further that. And it's a hard thing when there's not much to give to go ahead and give. Right now there's a lot of need right here in the church. There's a lot of need in this pocket of Blair County. This may well be an opportunity to ex exhibit Jesus by having been with him, to exhibit him in ways that we never saw coming and could never have dreamt or imagined, except for the situation and circumstance that God has put us in that he's allowed to come into our lives. The last and fourth thing in an Acts 4 philosophy is, the Acts 4 philosophy is lived out by people who are prepared to experience what Jesus experienced, which is affliction much of the time and persecution and to live through difficulty, but to do it with a confidence that can't be shaken. Jesus is alive because he defeated death. Jesus is still maneuvering, orchestrating, preparing a place for us. He's not done. He hasn't stopped. And I believe and trust in that, and I hope you do too, so that we can grow into the Acts 4 church. Maybe God is creating and turning the page in our history here at Tipton, uh, creating and, and preparing us to become. If you have questions or concerns, I encourage you, please call me. You can email me. I miss seeing your faces. I hope that someday we can actually do a Bible study like this in a room face-to-face. -face. Uh, in the meantime, I trust that you'll continue reading through Acts 4 for our Bible study to continue next week with the first point of Acts 4 philosophy. Until then, may God bless you as you commit to the truths in His Word. Goodbye.